pilots do. There are some excellent superstar engineers in the industry. Right now, Unix is hot. People love, oh, Unix guys. These AS400 VMS uh, guys, they were rock stars. TCL, fantastic stuff. And so part of the TCL had an embedded script engine, and that's why we have an embedded script engine. Very powerful. And syntax, we decided to use C-sharp style syntax. Anyway, so that was the basic model. Now here I showed you that this, you know, this Unix model really provides very little to no leverage, right? It's very expensive to, 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 to do things. Now the Monad platform, you know, I have this common investment that the more I invest in that, the more everything benefits, okay? And so that's why, you know, you write a commandlet today, and what do you get, right? And so the idea was that I was going to go to you, a developer, and I was going to say, hey, I need you to write some commandlets. And you were going to say, I'm busy. I was like, no, 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 I really write, you need you to write some commandlets. And you were going to say, I'm busy. I was like, okay, wait, stop. Let me be clear. Here's what I need you to write. I need you to write the code you and only you can do. That guy, he can't write the code. That guy can't write the code. You're the only guy that can write this code. And in exchange, what I'm going to do is I'm going to deal with the parsing. You got a D in, pars in parsing in college? Don't worry about it. Not a problem. I do the parser. I'm going to do the d parameter validation. I'm going to do the help. I'm going to do the type coercion, the pipelining, ubiquitous parameters, logging, object utilities, formatting, outputting, converting, exporting, implicit remoting, proxies, just enough administration. You get all that for free. You only write the code you and only you can do. And then in addition to those things for the commandlets, I'll also be able to have remoting, workflow, jobs, proxies, IntelliSense, desired state, just a ton of value. So it turned out that indeed, and the developers really get this, boy, I just did, I just did this and I got that? That's a really, that's a really good deal. Um, and indeed, it is a good deal. Okay, so this is the, this is the original document. Now the thing I want to highlight here is, you know, that's what somebody types in. You got a common parser, and then what appears to be a, a traditional Unix model, you know, A pipe to B pipe to C. It's not at all. There's some very sophisticated technology in there. In fact, it's, a, it's what we call an object flow engine. So it's like a data flow engine, but instead of data flow, it's object flow. A data flow engine has a graph of compute units that you pass control to. It then runs until it produces data. That data then flows to the next compute unit, and the data arriving at the next compute unit causes the next computer to, compute unit to run. Now, the original design, notice I said a graph, a directed graph. Uh, notice I did not say a directed ASIC graph, a cyclical graph. In fact, the original design was to allow cycles. It was to allow cycles so that I could express monitoring and event management solutions. Now, unfortunately, this is one of those examples where as an architect, I, I over-trusted one of my engineers and he went and screwed it all up. And instead he said, oh, well, oh, we're just a, uh, we just know how to do command lines. So he, direct, he did a directed graph that only does pipelines. But the original intent was to be able to have the engine be able to support monitoring and event processing. The gotcha was there was no way to, no way to, uh, no syntax, good way to solve the syntactic problem of that. Anyway, but here's the thing I want to point out. So you, you type all that, we create this graph, and then the runtime uh, gives control to the process commandlet. It then runs until output is ready. Now then what happens is it doesn't go to the where commandlet. Instead it goes to the runtime. And what happens is the runtime looks at the where commandlet and says, oh, what are your data, what's your data contract? What do you need and what do I have? And then it does whatever coercion, casting, shredding, um, whatever manipulation is required, enumeration, unfolding, to meet the data contract of the downstream commandlet. And it does it again and again and again. That's why you get some of the magic that you get in PowerShell. Now here's an example that some of you probably know, but a lot of people don't. All right, let's see. Okay, so okay, so I did a GPS, and now there's this thing I just found this the other day. What is this? GPS, UC Mappy. Okay, so anybody know what this thing is? UC Mappy. Okay, so did you know this? Here, I'm going to pipe this. 
to dir. So get process pipe to dir. Did you know that can work? Watch what happens. Okay, so I get this process and I piped it to dir and it tells me, oh, program files, office, Office 16, Office 65. So that's an Office uh, file there. Now what happened? And the answer was, okay, I ran get process. It output a process object. I looked at the downstream object and I said, hey, can you take a process object? It says, I don't know what a process object is. I said, oh, okay, well what else can you take? It says, oh, do you have something called a path? It's like, yeah, I got a path. Well, I'll take that. So it took the path and then acted on it. Okay, so processes have paths, so it's pretty cool. Anyway, so that's, <laughs> that's the power of this engine. Now later, I'm not sure I talk about it, but the key is this distinction between is a binding versus has a binding, okay? And this is why PowerShell is so powerful. Is a binding says, hey, I can map, I can pipeline things that, I that are something, right? So like stop process, you say, oh, uh, it can accept things that are system, uh, that are process objects. Oh, great, it can accept things that are process objects. What produces things that are process objects? Well, get process. Anything else? No. Oh, so I can pipe those two commandlets together. That's great. That's what is a binding gives you. Now it's the highest quality binding you can get, right, the most sure binding you can get. It's also the weakest binding, the least powerful. The other thing you can do with, with to send a stop process is you can say, you can send it anything that has a name. Anything that has a name? Yeah, anything that has a name. Well, what can produce a name? And the answer is almost anything. Oh, almost anything. So almost anything you can pipe to stop process. Now there, it becomes very, very powerful, but also the binding's less sure, right? So I could do a dirt, like this has a name. There you go, let's see, let's see. So look there, we tried it. We tried this. It bound it, it tried to run it. Hey, cannot find a process with the name Apache get.txt. It tried it, okay? But, so why is this valuable? Because I might have a CSV file with things and name in it, and I pass it to it, that's gonna work. Or I might have taken that process object and serialized it into XML or JSON, and when I deserialize it, it has a name, and that's gonna work. Okay, so that this is a and has a, uh, that has a binding is why PowerShell is so powerful. Now, this was the uh, Monad runtime uh, component diagram written in the Monad document. The stunning thing about this is um, <laughs> if you asked one of, the, one of the team members today to draw you something, this is what they draw you. It's really quite amazing. Um, no significant rework at all. So the key is that we've got this common uh, engine in the middle, right? So we've got a parser, which is separated from the script execution engine, and it can be hosted by multiple hosts. There's the console host in the middle, there's rich GUI hosts like ISC, uh, server manager, et cetera, which hosts PowerShell. And then notice the script engine goes to the side and back up and talks to another host, the remote agent host. So PowerShell can talk to a host which hosts PowerShell, okay? Okay, and then the engine then talks to what? And the answer is a set of commandlets. And there are different sets of commandlets, the base ones, the platform commandlets, the host commandlets. So there might be a set of commandlets appropriate to uh, PowerShell ISE that are different than those for the command line XE. And it turns out that there are. Then everything can be audited and then I work on this extended type system. So remember I said, oh, well, .NET gives me about 70% of what I need out of a managing type system. Notice I didn't say 100% of what I needed. So I built this extended type reflector, ext adapted type system we came to know it as. And the gotcha is that um, there are things like WMI and ADO. If I go to a WMI, a .NET, if I get a .NET WMI object, I say, tell me what your properties are, it'll say, I have two. I have properties and system properties, and those are both hash tables that contain stuff. In other words, 
there's a bunch of people implementing .NET and they implement their own type system within .NET. And so he said it was great. So this adaptive type system or extended type reflector goes and maps those oddball systems so that they look like PowerShell objects. The other thing was, remember I mentioned this has a binding, okay? So p stop process will stop anything that has a name. But what if I've got something that's really interesting, but it didn't call it name, it called it process name. It ain't gonna work. It isn't a process object, and it doesn't have a name. They went and called it process name, okay? Well, the extended type system allows me to have a type annotation and extension system, which I can use or you can use. And it allows me to do things like, that, like for that type, whenever they ask for name, give them the process name instead. So let me show you that. And that's literally, and, and by the way, and by doing that type, then the binding just works. So this is really a clever mechanism for us to get around those programmers that didn't do their job and make it all work up to begin with. Now in reality, they sort of couldn't because I'm integrating components from completely different companies. Now I try and provide a style guide and clear guidance on namings, but the reality is there's too many things out there to get that right and too much variance. But we have a way to get it right after the fact. Because if I went to those guys and I say, hey, rename your property, they'd say, what are you, out of your mind? I, I published it, I can't rename my property. So, so notice, I don't know if you notice this, but uh, well, let's look, look here. Uh, a process object doesn't have company or description. In fact, let's, let's show you that. So what was that thing called? Get process. Okay, so that was link, it was link. So, so notice I say, comp I can't spell company, it's pretty sad, but anyway. So Microsoft and description is uh, Microsoft linked. Now it turns out the process object doesn't have those properties. So how was I able to do that? And the answer is, I decided these were very important things. People like these things. And so you see here, company, it's a script property. This is part of that extended type system. And when you ask for script property, what it's gonna do is, or, sorry, for company, it's gonna go to this main module, file version, company name, and for description, same thing. And so you're able to take this, execute code to give you the variable. We don't use it very much, but has anybody ever played with property sets? Yeah, one, oh, one, a couple. So look at this, it says property sets. PS resources. So in, in format table, you can give the names of the properties like I did here, or you can give the name of a property set. And the property set is a named set of properties. Pretty powerful stuff. And then there is alias properties. So here, indeed, this command has process name and we map it to name. Okay, so that's what the extended type system was. Okay, so, so that's basically, the, oh, this whole stuff all got laid out in 2002. 2002, okay? So let's see how we've done. Here are the basic ideas, the automation model, the shell, the management models, uh, remote scripting, and the management console. In version one, this was the big release. This is the groundbreaking release, but had lots of limitations. At the time, I could only implement commandlets in .NET. That was it, .NET or nothing. Um, and we did have the type adapters. We had the object pipeline, object utilities, the language, did a great job there. Uh, we had functions, but we didn't have script functions. You, the functions were like informal functions. We had the debugger, we had security, you know, interactive shell with a debugger. Uh, rare. Uh, the management models, we just had one, the namespaces, that's, you know, file system, registry, certificate. Uh, for remoting, the only thing we had in version one was WMI. And then for the management console, we had our simple REPL loop and PowerShell. 
Version 2 was a big release. Version 2, I added script commandlets. Now I could write commandlets, not just in .NET, but in PowerShell itself. Huge thing. We had the help. Modules allowed us to take and share things. We had transactions, data language, splatting. We began to add more and more. Originally, we had sort of an interactive scripting and um, a simple bash style. But you see here in version two, we try and extend this to be more friendly to developers. We had trap as an error handling mechanism, which is very traditional in an interactive shell, but we added try catch to be more developer friendly. Had block comments. Script internationalization now meant that Microsoft Microsoft Teams could now ship commandlets because they were full first-class citizens. You know, Microsoft couldn't ship something if it couldn't be internationalized. So now you can internationalize things. We added jobs, but they were only background jobs at this point. We added eventing. And then version two gave us remoting. This was the thing that was the crucial missing step. And then we added ISC and out grid view. Version three, version three was the cross the chasm release. By and large, my conclusion is that, that people are successful to the degree to which they look for a commandlet, that they, they, they think about what they want to do, and they find a commandlet that helps them do that. If it's not there, then they got to do scripting, and that really separates a ton of people out. A bunch of people say, yep, I'm, I love it, I want to be that, I'm, a, I'm really a developer trapped in the body of an IT pro, and I want to express my developer self, and this has given me the opportunity to do that. The harder, the better. This is great. It's a learning experience. And lots of people have done that and been very successful. A number of IT pros have said, Ugh, that's hard. Click next, click next, click next. So, so this is the release where those click next guys really had a chance to be successful. Because we went from, I think, what was it, 200 and some odd commandlets to over 2,400 commandlets. And how do we do that? And the answer is the CDXML. CDXML is the technology that, well, coupled with a new way to write, write WMI providers, the CDXML would then take them and you generate script commandlets for the WMI providers. And that's how we got a ton, a ton, a ton of coverage from Windows. So big, big benefit there. Workflow, uh, updatable help. We fixed that, oh, you, uh, some people in the room are still on PowerShell version two. Man, you want to get off that thing. This is the one where we fixed the singleton collection problem. You know, you said dollar sign X equals get process something star. And the question is, did that return one or multiple things? And the difference, not knowing the answer to that caused all sorts of pain. Well, we fixed that pain in version three. Does everybody know about that? Do you know what I'm talking about? Yes or no? Is that a yes? yes. Yeah. Does anybody not know about that? If you don't, you should say so because I'll show you. It's awesome. Okay. I'll show you. Okay, great. So here's the problem. Prior to version two, you'd say this. Dollar sign X. Oh, let's do it this way. Right, and so, so that code there would only work if the value I gave when I did a read host uh, what mapped to a single file or a single process. If it wasn't, then what I had to do <coughs> was that, okay? Because otherwise you get a, an error. So let's try this. So let's see. Oh, and by the way, then if you coded it this way uh, and you gave a value, if you gave a value which returned multiple files, this would, or multiple processes, this was, would work. But if you gave a, a, a value which returned a single file or single process, this would fail. That's the problem. Okay. So what you ended up having to do it was always something weird. Well, let's see. Is something like you had to say. Yeah, so you had to write your code that way, right? And that, that ampersand paren cast anything to an array, 
and then zero, one, and just, so that's how you had to write your code. How hideous. Okay, so let's see. So now, I run this and I'll say star SS, say star SS, it finds the first one, yay. I do it again, and I say LSASS. -S -S. Okay, so it's gonna fail, right? Because I didn't do, I only provide one, and the answer is it works. Why? Because we fixed it. <laughs> <laughs> but wait, wait, it gets better. What about this? Well, if I say LSASS, -S -S, of course, it's gonna work. We knew that was gonna work. But what if I say star SS? Now what's gonna happen, right? It's gonna break because I just did, I didn't tell which one I want. And the answer is we turned it into a, an array operator. So you get the names of all the elements in the array. So anybody, I got a funny, uh, run late. I got a funny story about that sometime. Maybe over drinks, ask me about that one. Uh, okay, now, we added auto-loading. Uh, we added the DLR. So in, we now do hotspot on-the-fly compilation of your code. Find out what's going slow. Compile it to native code. Run it fast. Uh, we added the AST for be able to do syntax parsing. Uh, SIM, JSON, web support. The jobs we expanded to schedule jobs, WMI jobs, workflow jobs. So there's domain-specific ways to create the unique type of jobs, but then there's common ways to manage them. A um, bunch of other great stuff. And then, sorry, and now in version four, there's a number of things. This was, this was a three-year release. This was a one-year release. The big thing here is the DSC support. And you'll see that going forward, this is where we're putting all of our energy on desired state configuration. All the chips are there, okay? So at some point I looked at this and I said, well, I should, I should kind of give myself a grade. How do we do? And these are the things that I think have had the most significant impact. Now I'll say that there are other things on here that I think will have great impact, but to date haven't had the kind of transformational impact that I think things here have. Uh, obviously version one had a lot of that. Remoting was crucial. Script commandlets was the thing that allowed the CDXML. It actually allowed the generation of commandlets. You know, Programs that write programs, and that's been incredibly powerful. Modules, the ability to share. Auto-loading, transform the experience. DLR and AST, transform uh, performance and tooling. The run as and constrained endpoints gave us security, and desired state configuration is, is gonna significantly transform the platform in terms of simplicity of configuration and provisioning. Well, I said, well, what, what didn't we do well? What, what don't, do I think I'd say was per potentially a bad investment? And honestly, I think there's only two things that I sort of regret. And I say sorta. Transactions, I sort of, I do regret. Uh, we spent a, not a ton, but we spent a bunch of money on transactions and I really don't see it in use today. And I think I was on the wrong side of history with transactions. The, the idea here had been that it's just a, my observation that software works when it works and fails when it fails, which sounds like a completely stupid statement, but it's actually quite correct and profound when you think about it. So software works when it works. In general, people write code expecting it to work, and then they test to make sure it does work, and then they're happy. Hey, I'm a great guy. They don't spend much time on the error cases. In fact, one of my favorite programmers is a prototyper, and we were having this conversation. I had a very similar conversation, and he starts to get all agitated. I was like, whoa, what, what's up? He says, that's right. When you write protocols, you write all the error conditions first, and then when you're done, you go back and you write the success cases. It's like, you are my kind of programmer. Because most people don't code that way. Most people, like the error cases are some aftermath, they consider it failure, they don't invest much time in it, and that's why when something goes wrong, it's often the first time you're testing those error conditions and things go to, go to hell. So that's why they, they fail. So transactions was an attempt to, to do that, and produce an all or nothing world. And I think the, again, I think I'm the wrong side of history with that. I think the world's going much more to a world that says, hey, if there's a problem, just blow it away, start from scratch, do it again, 
and, uh, and change whatever's required to make it work successfully this time. If that didn't work, blow it away, start it from scratch. In other words, the DevOps model. The DevOps model says, hey, there are these things called snowflake servers, these special, precious, unique things. Those are evil. Kill them. Treat your servers like cattle, not like pets, you know? Uh, anyway, and then the data language, we use the data language, but I had originally intended to be a security boundary, and it's too porous to be a security boundary. So it's useful, but it's not what I needed it for. All right. Here, we're not going to go through, how are we doing on time? What time is it? What's that? Okay, so I'm not going to go through all these, but I'll give you a, a, a gist. In the document, I did a, I wrote my own sort of performance review in the document, which is to say we came up, uh, Jeffrey Moore has this concept of a market relevant statement. And these seem very, very simple to do, but I'll tell you it was one of the hardest things I ever did. Um, and when you finish writing them, you know exactly what you're doing, exactly why, and what success looks like, okay? So for these, what you do is you say for audience who, qualifier, product, in this case, PowerShell, a value proposition, which is what are you doing for those people? And then, unlike alternative, PowerShell, what's the differentiator? And then you repeat it, the unlikes, and you re repeat it for the audiences. And it's extremely difficult, but then you know what to do and why it's important. So then I did this for the audiences, developers, application testers, uh, administrators, power users, and power GUI users. And you can go in the Moda Manifesto and be very crisp about what it was I was trying to do and uh, make your own assessment as to how I did it. By the way, how many people have ever read the Monad Manifesto? Oh, well, I encourage you to go read it. It's really quite an interesting doc. I mean, I, I'm continually shocked when I, when I read it. So I'm going to go through a few of these and then skip a few. So I'm going to give myself a scorecard. For the application developers, I'd say it's largely successful, but a lot of room to improve. In particular, the world continues to be more heterogeneous. Uh, Bill Gates stopped kicking people and saying, do everything in .NET. Now there's a bunch, you know, dog's breakfast of, of developer technologies out there. So we have to have different language bindings and different environmental bindings. So we got to continue. That'll be an area of continual investment. Okay? And the ability to use uh, CDXML to be able to map things is very important. In fact, I think I talk about this later, but um, one of the important areas is REST APIs. Lots of people are developing REST APIs. Uh, we, in general, don't like REST APIs because they're just random, just random crap. I call it a ghetto API. You know, it's just, uh, but, but it, it's useful, it, but it, it represents more of a philosophy than a pattern. And even the philosophy is abandoned about 60% of the time. So it's really just crap. Um, OData, however, is REST where we said, hey, you know, let's, let's be clear about what we're trying to do here. When we do REST, we often do the same things. So let's do the same things in the same way. When we want to talk about a singleton, let's talk about it this way. When, or an instance, let's talk about it this way. When we talk about a collection, let's refer to it that way. When we do filtering, let's express it this way. If you have this element of a filter, use this keyword. And if you do those things, then when somebody learns a REST API, then they can learn the next one, they can make a set of guesses, and they'll be right. Okay, as opposed to having to go to each REST interface and as though it's a new thing. So that's why we like OData. And the point about that is that we're doing work now, and you'll see it in, hopefully in July, uh, to be able to take a, an OData endpoint and create a CDXML for it. Now, originally this was intended so that as an IT pro, you could point to an OData endpoint and get a set of commandlets. It turned out that even with OData, as much standardization as it provides, it's still kind of random in the implementations. Uh, and so what, instead what we'll do is we'll turn it into a developer tool where you point to an OData endpoint and it'll create a data structure that then you can edit and when you're happy with it, then you use that data structure to create the, the, the PowerShell commandlets. So you take responsibility. You know, if you don't, this thing said you supported top and, and sort, but if you didn't, go edit the file so that, so that we're not giving customers runtime errors. Anyway, um, so we, we expect the world to be heterogeneous. We need to continually develop in that world. This has been a super productive dev model. 
and provides a very high level of consistency for some things, right? The problem, however, is a cultural one. And then a bunch of the artifacts were written by developers who aren't actually running their own software and therefore don't have our admin sensibilities. Uh, or people who weren't using PowerShell and therefore don't have PowerShell sensibilities. The number of people where they pick the wrong name or they do something kind of goofy, it's because they weren't using PowerShell as their developer tool or because they weren't ad adminning things. Um, we've had poor tooling support and uh, so the key solution is that developers need to use PowerShell and use their own software. So I think we